Welcome to The Drummer and the Great Mountain, a podcast where we share effective tips and practices for working with adults ADD, ADHD in a natural, effective way without the use of medications. Each episode, join me, your host, Batman Saram, along with the author of The Drummer and the Great Mountain, Michael Joseph Ferguson. Join Michael and myself in an interactive discussion of sharing our stories as we journey together in transforming what can be the gift of being what we call hunter types. This podcast is intended to be your audio companion to the book written by Michael, who joins me each episode where we both will strive to foster dialogue, give you our personal insights, and share both of our experiences on this similar path that we are all on. Our intention and hope is that along with the book, this podcast gives you an additional perspective as you listen to us delve deeper into each chapter of the book to give you even more tools to go along with what it is that you are reading. Visit us at drummerandthegreatmountain.com to purchase the book and look for more tools, tips, and updates, as well as giving us feedback on this podcast. Join our growing global community of creative types, entrepreneurs, and out-of-the-box thinkers on our shared journey. Welcome to the Drummer in the Great Mountain podcast. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I'm your host, Michael Joseph Ferguson. How you doing? On today's podcast, we are going to be talking about overcoming analysis paralysis. This is a huge challenge for us hunter types. We all get into this sort of indecision jig where we're like trying to figure out, should I do this or should I not do this? Back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And it can burn a lot of energy and cause a lot of anxiety and create um, unseen circumstances because we take too long to make a decision. So we'll be talking about what is analysis paralysis? Why is it common for us hunter types? What's going on in the brain? What's going on in our general tendency? that would perhaps make us more vulnerable to be going into that kind of challenging space. Um, and we'll talk about some of the principles to follow when you're making, you're going through the decision-making process. It's so important to have a framework so that when you, you can anticipate like, oh, I know this is a challenge for me, therefore I'm going to make plans ahead of time so I have a method to break the tie if I'm stuck or I'm just not making any progress in making a decision. And then we'll go into some really specific tools that are tried and true, that have been tested, I've, especially through my coaching practice. These are, I've been using and over and over again. I know they work. Um, so we'll be talking about those tools. And then also I've provided for you a free PDF worksheet for this episode because I felt like it really needed it. So to get that, you can go to drummerinthegreatmountain.com forward slash episode 75. That's drummerinthegreatmountain.com forward slash episode 75. And you'll be able to, to get some of the key points that we're going to discuss today. So you have it as a worksheet or as like a quick tips sheet where you can like, if you're stuck, you can look at the sheet and go, okay, wait, let me just go through this process. And it can get you out of the spin of overanalyzing or just getting totally paralyzed when making decisions. So that's coming up in just a second. So I know this year has been crazy and super challenging for a lot of you. 2020 has lasted for at least three years now. And I hope you guys are doing well. I hope you're, you're managing it well. I know for some of us, uh, what I've witnessed for a lot of us hunter types, when it first kind of hit, coronavirus hit, we were all like energized because it was a different, it was a shift of pace. So many of us I saw were, were actually more empowered in some ways. Um, but as time wears on and things, you know, there's all the different things that have come up over the last couple of months, I know it can start to weigh on you, uh, depending on where you're at. So I hope you're doing well. I uh, we just want to encourage you to utilize the tools that we talk about in the podcast to keep you level in terms of keeping your exercise routine really good, that you're eating well, 
Uh, and the tendency is when we get stressed, we actually go in the opposite of what we need to be doing. Uh, so pay attention to that. If you find yourself falling off some really good health routines, um, it's a really good time to get back on. This is when you need it the most. So I just want to encourage you to keep up with that. For those of you who are new to the podcast, I know we've got a lot of new listeners. Uh, definitely go to our free mini course. Uh, that's like a five day. You get one email per day. It's a short little audio um wake you up in the morning, get you going, uh, and give you some ideas of, of kind of what we talk about on this podcast. What's the ground plane of some of the key principles that we discuss. So you can get that at drummer the great mountain.com forward slash mini course. Um, really quick. I just want to shout out to the, our, we just wrapped up another eight week online support group. That's why you haven't heard from me. Uh, it's hard for me to juggle that and also do podcasts. I'd like to keep the quality up. So, um, just want to say thank you all so much for joining us. You guys were fantastic. What an amazing group of super talented, super creative and really kind individuals. I'm just always blown away by the audience that listens to this podcast, that you guys, uh, just such an honor to work with all of you. I learned a lot from you, and it was just a pleasure to see your growth and things click for you um, as we went through the process. So thank you all so much. Looking forward to staying in touch with all of you. And uh, one other quick announcement, uh, Dr. Ben Page, who was on episode 67, has put out a really awesome new book. It's called Playing in the Dirt, The Key to Sustainable Health. And it goes into the science and also the necessity for us as humans to get our hands and feet in the dirt, into the soil, like how much that affects our immune system and our mood. He talks a little bit about just the studies around it. It is fantastic. So I highly encourage you to reach out, check it out. Uh, again, it's called Playing in the Dirt, the Key to Sustainable Health. Uh, the link will be in the description of this podcast. And uh, what I've liked about Dr. Ben Page's approach is he takes, um, he places a strong emphasis on nature connection. And I, and I feel like as we talk about uh, what I call the essentials, which is uh, for us hunter types, that's uh, the nutrition, that's also the cardio and eliminating things that are are taking us down that are exacerbating our ADHD challenges. But on top of that, I I'm feel like I'm going to add one more to that list, and that's going to be nature connection, because there's just so much documented proof that it really helps, especially children. I think the studies have been more on ADHD kids, but how much nature connection helps reduce uh, ADHD symptoms and really gives us more energy and vitality. And if when you think about the hunter farmer theory, how much that being connected to the world around you, if you were in a hunter gatherer society, you would need to be super in tune with all of the environment around you. And we were, this is like where we learned, we had, we got all these superpowers from the hyper focus, all the things that could be the challenge, but also the benefit. And I feel like when we get into nature and we spend time there, it it can reconnects us to it, re, it plugs us back into those circuits that were wired very long time ago in our ancestry and we need it we need it for our health we need it for our our mental clarity it engages us on a level that that sitting in front of a computer <laughs> just has does not have the power to do so so highly encourage you to check out this book playing in the dirt the key to sustainable health by dr ben page link is in the description Okay, so let's dive into this. What is analysis paralysis? So let's just make sure we're all on the same page with this. It's basically a difficulty or complete inability to make a decision as the result of overanalyzing the situation. And basically, you just keep spinning and keep spinning, going back and forth, feeling like you need to get more and more information, and you're stuck, and you can't trust yourself, and you just feel like, and then it just goes and goes and goes. Uh, it's really common for us hunter types, and it's typically accompanied by lots of anxiety and frustration. Completely stuck, and it's common. It's something you go through a lot. So if this is you, um, listen up. <laughs> we got some ideas to work with on this. So basically, it could be anything from small decisions 
uh, which is what to have for lunch, which items to purchase, where to go after work, decisions during your work day. So it could be like in that realm, but it's also big decisions like where to go on vacation, career choices, school choices, health decisions. It's basically anything that gets thrown your way. You spin on it. You spend a lot of time dwelling on it and time ticks by and you feel more and more overwhelmed by the situation. So basically paralyzed with indecision. And the big challenge is taking too long on a decision often can have detrimental consequences. So it's, if it's a health decision and you wait too long, then that could turn into something very serious. Uh, it could be something that costs you money because you didn't make a decision soon enough. Uh, definitely missed opportunities. Um, and overall sustained stress which is really not good for your physical body. So that's the terrain. I think most of you know this one. I mean, almost every hunter type that I've talked to um, has some form of this or other. So that's sort of the terrain, but let's go into why. Why is it that hunter types have such a challenge with making decisions? So first off, it's a form of perfectionism. So it's connected to that hyper-focus mastery tendency of just d going deep and deeper and deeper into something. It's got to be just right. And it's the belief that there's one perfect decision. It's like, okay, there's a perfect decision here. I've got to find it. I've got to figure it out. Okay, is it this? Is it this? And no, you keep going deeper and you're back and forth. And then it just kind of gets fuzzy. And then you come back to it. It's that tendency uh, that manifests in other ways for us hunter types. And a lot of times it's just you're afraid to make a mistake. It's like, I want to make the right, quote unquote, right decision. And so because of that, it's like, okay, there's one way to do this. I don't want to mess this up. So it's got to be just right. And there's also a need for certainty when things in the future are inherently uncertain. So it's like something to grab hold of. It's like, okay, if I make that decision then I'm level again. Okay, that's I know that that's the right decision and I can just feel calm and it's perfect and I have something I can I can stand on. It's strong. I it'll hold me up. But the future is inherently uncertain, so it's almost impossible to find that. But there is sometimes in the back of our head that thought that okay, if I just make this right decision then everything's going to go okay. Um but I think more specifically for us hunter types, it's also connected with what causes us to procrastinate and it has to do with the having less dopamine receptors and that restlessness that need for stimulation so when a decision is not urgent um there's no emergency there's no stimulation to it so it kind of gives us we kind of stay in that fuzzy space with it a little bit but as it raises to the level of emergency and there's a lot of stimulation that creates that dopamine release and the focus then we can often make the decision and sometimes it's a good decision sometimes it's not and some of us have gotten into a really bad habit of doing that with our decision making and um, what we'll talk about today is what are some other ways to approach decision making that doesn't have to involve tons and tons of stress? Um, and also, I think there's another key piece to this. Uh, and this is something I was reflecting on. So this was this topic came up during our last uh, group that just wrapped up uh, last eight week support group. And one of the participants mentioned it. Thank you, Trish, for for uh, bringing it up in, in the group. Uh I think it part of it has to do with um, past pain and trauma from bad decisions. I think f I can I can relate to that to, to my past. I can feel like there's times where I've been uh, impulsive in the past, and so now I become very hyper focused on I've got to make a really good decision on this because I have made mistakes in the past that did really hurt, and so this can often color the decision. It often makes us. Uh, more contracted because there's there's a like some physical or emotional pain connected to some part of the decision making process that uh, as we're more mature we're like okay well I don't want to go through that again or I don't want to take that person through it again uh, and this is all playing behind the scenes we're not conscious of it so we overcorrect and spend too much time deliberating instead of taking a moment, maybe going through a short process, which we'll talk about, and just making the decision and moving on. 
So now let's move into some general principles when making a decision. There's a few principles that I think before we go into the tools and specific steps that we need to all kind of wrap our head around so that when we go into strategies, they make more sense. And also you have a little bit more of a structure in your head of like, here's how I approach decision making, which is something that we probably should have been taught in school. But for most of us, we have it. I think the only thing that I may have been taught is like pros and cons, but that's that's kind of rough. There's, It's hard to do that daily, especially when it's smaller decisions. You don't want to have to go through all those steps. So it's important to understand some general concepts when making decisions. Uh, the first one is making any decision will usually move you forward. So for most decisions, you can usually double back if you need to, if more information is acquired. So you got to get that in your head. Most decisions, you can just make a decision, move forward, and then, okay, wait, no, I can pull it back and and move another direction. For most decisions, that is the case. Uh, And most decisions are not forever or make or break decisions. And when we're in analysis paralysis, that's how it feels. It feels like this is forever. I have to make the right decision. It's this make or break. And that doesn't make any sense because especially if it's like lunch or (laughs) where to go after work, but it feels like that when you're like, oh, should I do this? Should I do this? What's the best decision moving forward? So recognizing that most decisions are not forever or make or break decisions can take some of the pressure off so you can just make a decision. Also, working hard and spending a lot of time deliberating doesn't always equate to making the best decision. Another, that's another fallacy that we usually have in the back of our head. It's like, this is a big decision. I got to just spend tons of time. I've got to really sweat to make a good decision, make a good decision. And especially when taking longer has detrimental consequences. So if you look back, how many times have you deliberated and deliberated and then you waited too long and then it caused you a lot of suffering? So clearly, just working hard, spending a lot of time deliberating doesn't always equate to making the best decision. Also, when when making a decision, asking for support is usually a good tactic. So someone who is not emotionally involved in the decision will usually have a better perspective, cheerly by the fact that they are not they, they're not dealing with the emotional strings that you're dealing with. They can see it clearer than you can. I can state that as a coach. I mean, most of the time, it's just, I'm just out of the situation so I can help people make decisions. It's not like I'm brilliant. It's just that I can see the situation differently than that person who's stuck in it. So, um, and we're most, most of us are in that situation. You know that when someone else comes to you and they're struggling with something, you can see it clearly And for them, it's like, oh, I don't know. Should I go this way? Should I go that way? But because you're not, you're not stuck in that, uh, the emotional, the stickiness of it, you can help them make the decision because usually you can see like, oh, it's obviously this decision is the better decision. Um, And then also taking too long to make a decision, as I stated, creates prolonged stress and anxiety that can lower your immune system. So if you don't have a good system for making decisions, it's actually taking years off your life because you're living in a lot of stress. And I can state for most uh, hunter types, including myself, um, decision making can cause a lot of anxiety. And having a good way to approach decision making can greatly reduce your stress and anxiety. So, and then finally, I think as far as the general principles go, go the, uh, the best way to move forward for most decisions is decide, then assess, and adjust after that. I mean, if you can, most decisions, you can approach it that way. Decide, make a decision. Go, th- go through, make the decision, watch how it unfolds, assess, was that a good decision? This could be a day, a week, a month. Uh, and then after that, adjust. It's like, okay, was that the best decision? And as we'll discuss, if you take that tactic of decide, assess, then adjust, and you kind of get that as part of your decision-making process, you start to see, oh, I could have approached it this way. It wasn't an all or nothing. I could have just said, okay, I'm going to test this out. And that's how I look at it. 
for most decisions, I always ask myself, can I test this out? I rarely make long-term decisions unless I've really drilled in and said, yes, this is the best way to go, where I've had real world on the ground experience with whatever it is. So if it's taking a course or it's um, it's like, should I go to this place to exercise versus this place? Or should I work with this person versus this person? Usually I'll like, okay, if it's like that kind of decision, if it, like it's a coach or a counselor or something like that, I'll say, okay, I want to talk to them. I want to test it out. I'm not going to make any long-term commitments uh, commitments until I know that this is a good fit. And because I have that installed as part of my decision-making process, it's a lot easier to just go, okay, well then let's just try this one out. Uh, Instead of going, oh, there's the perfect person I should work with in this situation. I need to work with this marketing person because they really know what they're doing. Or maybe, but this one's pretty good too. You can just go, okay, well, I'll test this one out. I'll do one session with them. Let's see what they have. And then I'll do another session and then get the feel for like, who, where's, what's the best fit. And I, I'd say for coaching, this is the thing that I come back to almost every session with, with most clients. It's like how, when you're stuck, it's like, what is the, the next step that you can take that will give you the information you need so that you can make a better decision? Uh, I'm thinking back to one of my coaching clients was thinking about partnering as a work partner with another person. And he was delivering, he was deliberating back and forth and back and forth. I said, okay, wait a minute. What, how do you test this out? That's a huge decision that granted, this is a situation where it could have big consequences. Going into partnership with someone else in a work situation can have very bad consequences if you're not careful. So I said, why don't you, what can you do to test it out? Can you test it out for a month? Instead of making a long-term commitment, can you do like a month commitment or a two month commitment so that both of you can test it out? And so he came back after a month and he's like, oh my God, thank you so much. That would have been terrible. And he tested it out and it just was not a fit. It didn't turn into anything huge. They were able to like clean it up and move on. And because there was an awareness that this is not an all or nothing forever decision, it changed the course of how he approached his business and it made a big difference and he found someone else to work with. So these are things that when you're approaching a decision as a hunter type, know that there's a tendency towards all or nothing and then you need to pull back and go, can I test this out? Is this decision, can I just move a little bit forward check it out, see if it works, but make a little bit of a commitment and then come back and then assess it. So again, decide, assess, then adjust. Okay, so those are the general principles when approaching decision making. Now let's go into some specific strategies that you can follow. So the first one, and I think it's really important, especially when it's a bigger decision, is clearly state your goal. What is your objective? If you're not clear about the objective, then you're going it, to decision making. It's it's pointless. You have to know what what's the purpose of this decision. What's at stake? What are you trying to accomplish? So train yourself to do this in every situation. You can do it very quickly. Just ask yourself, what's the goal? What is the objective in this decision? Uh, that alone often comes to just help you make a clear decision. And this has made a huge difference in my life. I use this all the time. I I just stop and say. What is the purpose? What's the objective that I'm trying to accomplish in this decision? And I've noticed also with my clients, this works really well. And I'm constantly asking them, set your intention. What is the goal? What are you trying to accomplish in this accomplish in this decision? And again, just by doing that, that often makes the decision very clear. Strategy number two, very important. Set a time limit for yourself. You're faced with the decision. You can say, okay, by tomorrow morning, I will make this decision. So when you set a time limit, then it gives you permission to go down the rabbit hole, study, research, but then you know at the end, you got to come up for air and then make the decision. So setting a time limit is so helpful in allowing you to fully dive into the research and the study of whatever it is. And then at the end of it, you make your decision. So this is definitely for like for like purchases or or a decision with work or something like that. Set a time limit for yourself, and then say by this day or this time, I will make the decision. And connected with this is 
Another strategy is assemble enough information to make a good decision, but not too much. So the tendency for us hunter types is to just go down that rabbit hole and it's and it's actually stimulating to like, look at this and should I go this way? And there's a little stress involved and it's very stimulating. But if you just keep going and keep going, you're obsessing. You're kind of, you're locked into that hyper-focus mode and you need to pull yourself back, take a break. And again, coming back to set a time limit you, you give yourself permission to do that, but at the end of it, you know that you have to make a decision by this time or this date. Another strategy is make decisions when you're most clear. This is such a big one for hunter types, and I talk about this a lot on the podcast. For most of us, we have a good like mental clarity usually is about like mid morning to early afternoon for most of us. Everyone's different, but it's usually a couple hours after waking up and then maybe three good hours, maybe four where you're like mentally clear, you're more able to handle ground plane decisions. So for me, I never make important decisions, like especially in the afternoon or evening. That's usually when I'm at my lowest. I'm usually not in a good space to make a decision. I'm going to like punt that to the next day and I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to make the decision between like 10 and 12 because that's when I'm most clear and most able to handle that situation. And I'm going to trust the decisions I make during that time are usually better decisions across the board. So you're usually lowest in late afternoon, evening. Sometimes we get a little spike after dinner. Um, but if it's a bigger decision, I would recommend making that during your peak time. If it's something like a bigger, something, a bigger decision. Now it's obviously for lunch or some small decision, then there's other ways to approach that. But if it's a, if it's a decision, you're like, feel like, Oh, I got to make, this is really important. I should deliberate on this, then make the final decision during that peak time. So it doesn't mean you can't assemble information and do your research anytime outside of that. But when it comes to actually finalizing the decision, try to do it in your peak time. And for most hunter types, that's late morning, early afternoon. Another strategy to get yourself out of analysis paralysis, narrow down your options as quickly as possible. So what options are definitely off the table? Figure that out as quickly as possible. So that otherwise you're kind of like, oh, I could do this and I could do this and could do this. Stop take out your journal, do whatever you need to do to just eliminate options so you can get down to, okay, it's between this and this or between these three options. And if you do that quickly, then it reduces the stress because you've narrowed it down. And then once you've narrowed it down, then you can say, okay, now I because you know what you're shooting for. But if you're like, oh, it could be this and then, oh, wait, wait, I could be over here. Again, coming back to clearly stating your goal really helps the situation. If you're clear about what you want to accomplish in the decision, then most of the time that narrows down the options. So narrow down your options as quickly as possible. Get those options that are definitely off the table out of your head. Another key strategy, especially when it's a bigger decision, is calling in support. Find someone you trust who knows more about the decision than you do, all of the, the topic and what's involved, and ask their opinion. In a sense, you're sort of delegating your decision-making to that person, but in situations, whether it's like a job decision or a health decision, it's really clear. It's that classic get a second opinion if you're feeling really stuck, who do you know that can give you perspective on it? Who's an expert in that field? Like who can you reach out to? And that's really helpful in bigger decisions, whether it's with your, if you own your own business and you're trying to figure out what to do next, then obviously calling in support's a really good thing. Or should I work with this person or should I take this job or should I take this job? When you have someone that has greater knowledge of the situation, you will feel more comfortable with the decision, especially after you ask for that support. And as I mentioned earlier, sometimes it's just someone you know that's just outside of the situation that doesn't have the emotional tangles that you have. 
and they and someone that you trust obviously some people can give you really bad advice so but at this point you know if you're older you kind of know okay i'm not going to ask that person but there's people in your life you do trust that if you reach out to them they'll either give you perspective or they'll say you know what i don't know and they may be able to forge you in a direction so that at least you're not stuck anymore so much of this is just again analysis paralysis it's getting yourself unstuck so that you can move forward and make a good decision So the next tip is something I use a lot in my coaching. It's something that I find myself saying over and over again. And I don't know if I had full clarity on this in my own life, but as I worked with a lot of different people, I started to see, oh, this tactic really, really works. And the tactic is scale your decision. So the tendency for us hunter types is to think it's forever, this is a forever decision, or for now on, I need to make, like, I'm going to do this and that's going to be it. It's all or nothing. That's the tendency. So when you scale the decision, you say, okay, instead of this is a decision forever and ever and ever, think in terms of let's try this out. Like, let's, how do I test this out for a short period of time? See how it works, assess it, come back scale the decision to a shorter period of time. So as I stated earlier, I rarely make decisions for like, okay, I'm just going to do this from now on. If I find myself thinking that way, I always stop and say, okay, how do I test this out? And that has made such a huge difference. And I think I've gotten even more clear about that for myself, working with a lot of people, because I see how easy, how much that makes the decision clear. And it gets you quicker to information you need to make bigger, better decisions down the road. So basically, how do you scale the decision? How do you get to a place where you can say, okay, um, how do we test this out for a couple of days, two weeks, a month? and then make a longer term decision. So that could be like a gym membership where you're like, okay, I'm gonna go, uh, I'm gonna just do drop-ins even though it costs a little more because then you can kind of assess, okay, is this the right fit for me or not? And then commit to the bigger thing. So a lot of times there are decisions based around a, a longer term commitment. We often run into those kinds of decisions. This is a really good way to approach them. What? How do I scale this decision to a shorter duration? So for example, if you own your own business, maybe you're like, okay, should I work with this marketing consultant or this marketing consultant? And you're like, oh, okay, well, they have like they have this package here and that this person has this package here and this is a big commitment and it's a lot of money and oh, okay, I don't know where to go. The first step is just call them on the phone, ask them lots of questions, and then ask them, can I test this out for a couple weeks? I really want to see if this is a good fit for both of us. Most people, especially people that you would want to work with, will do that. Oftentimes people that are like, I know, I kind of like, it's like, for me, that makes the decision because I can't commit to working with someone long term until I really get a sense of like who they are. Is this a good fit? Do they really understand the business? So I think that's a really good, good way to approach those kinds of work decisions where you're like, okay, if I can just test this out, see how it feels. If you feel relaxed and calm, then it's really easy to make the longer term commitment. So whenever you can, scale the decision so that you can get information you need to make a longer term commitment. So this next tip involves all those small decisions we make on a daily basis. And that's have a game plan to reduce the need for daily decision making. So you have a limited amount of will and energy every single day. So streamline your life to minimize unnecessary decision making. And a classic one is meal planning. So if you feel like, oh, I don't know what I should have this morning and um, or I don't know where to go for lunch and you're constantly like little stuff like that, but you find yourself obsessing over it. And I know a lot of you do it because I work with you. So I know this comes up a lot. Have a game plan. Say, OK, here's my menu of options every single day. And maybe you just sit down on Sunday and you say, here's the plan for the week. And you do it not just so you can be more organized, but you do it so that you don't have to make those 
those decisions in the moment and burn unnecessary energy. So have a game plan to reduce the need for daily decision making. That could be clothing, like what am I going to wear today? So that's a classic one. So like have a game plan, plan it out a little bit before, or give yourself just a very small limited option. Like here, I could either this or this so that it, you have a little freedom if you, if, especially if it's like where you want to go for lunch or something like that. But if you narrow it down to like one or two things and you can like, okay, then at least I can make the decision instead of just spending a lot of unnecessary energy spinning over it over and over again. So think about what can you do in your life? What decisions do you make on a daily basis where you find yourself grinding on them where you could easily just make a game plan maybe on Sunday, like you've got one day off Saturday where you kind of clear your head, maybe Sunday morning you get up and during your peak time between like 10 and 12, you sit down and go, okay, how do I plan the week out so that I can reduce the amount of daily decision making so that I can have that energy free for other stuff? So key tip, have a game plan to reduce the need for daily decision making. Connected to this is create decision rules for yourself, especially for decisions you make on a regular basis. So as we, this is kind of what we're talking about here, have a set of rules that you go off of and say, okay, I'm going to do, if, when I make a decision, I'm going to go through X, Y, and Z. And if nothing else, I'm going to flip a coin and that's how I'm going to make my decisions. And for l- approaching smaller like those mundane decisions, having a little like set of rules that you you've created for yourself makes the process a lot easier. And at the end of this uh, episode, I'm going to talk about how to use the worksheet that we have with this podcast. So that kind of gives you something you can just look at and go, okay, I'm going to go through those steps and that's going to help me make good decisions, but have a, have a set of rules that you've established for yourself so that you know how to approach your decision-making. Another key tip to get yourself out of the habit of analysis paralysis is create reflection time for your subconscious to do its work. So our subconscious is so much smarter than our conscious mind. So in order for it to do its job, we need to like turn off the spin of the conscious mind trying to deliberate and deliberate. That doesn't help. You're not giving space for your subconscious to do the job, take in the information and offer back to you, here's the here's a good decision. So how you create the space for that, there's two really key strategies that can help with this. One is meditation. So a daily practice of you quieting your mind, shutting off your conscious mind, getting into a space where... You're just focusing on your breath. You're quieting the spin of all the to do's and everything. And you're getting yourself, you're giving your mind a break. You're slowing the train down. And then it opens up space for your subconscious to do the job of helping you make a good decision. There's been so many times where I've practiced meditation and at the end of the meditation, I got the decision. Like it's clear to me. It's it was a, something I was struggling with or something that I was I was really spinning about and it just comes right in. And I'm like, that's it. I was I'm super clear that's the best decision and that I've moved forward. That happens a lot. And so meditation is such a gift in that way. And it's one of those hidden benefits of meditation. So that's one. Two is time in nature. So for me, why I place such an emphasis on not just doing cardio exercise, but getting outdoors into nature is that it turns off the, the, the man-made stuff. Like if you're out in nature and you're not seeing a bunch of med, like buildings and, and things that kind of remind you of constructed life and it reminds you of kind of this, this other force of nature that's constantly doing its thing. And it, it helps turn our brain off. It gets us into that space where we can just relax and open up. We ex- expand our awareness a bit. And for me, just with meditation, because I have this as part of my daily routine, I'll go for a run out in nature, and then I give myself that space after the run to just walk and take everything in and just process the day. That's when so many, one, good ideas come through, but also two, 
decisions that I've been spinning on, the clarity of what to do comes through. And so for me, I need to create that space. And I really guard that space in my schedule. I need that space to process everything else. If I just kept going and going and going and I never gave myself that space, I would just be crushed by anxiety. I would, be, I would never be, even be talking to you right now if that wasn't part of my daily routine. So to me, time in nature gives your brain a break. It clears your head. You can expand out. You're taking in nature versus sort of all the man-made stuff. And that's why like going to a gym or listening to a podcast, um, that's great. But if you can incorporate exercise and getting out in nature, and you can split them up. You can exercise at the gym and then go for a walk somewhere, but give yourself that space so that your subconscious can start working on things and give, offering up solutions or, or better ideas for getting out of analysis paralysis so you can get to a place where you're like, okay, that, that's the decision. And I can tell you for myself, it, it's usually very clear. If I give myself that, that space and I've been really grinding on something, It'll just float in and I'll go, "Mm, that's it. And I trust it. I've learned to trust it because I've made really good decisions based on me being in that space. And so that's when it'll filter through. So going back to my previous point of like making decisions when you're clear in the morning, this is the exception to that rule because I can state for the record that this has been probably the most important tool for decision making that I think I've ever I have I've ever like come across because it I trust that my subconscious knows more than my conscious mind. So finally, if it's a minor decision, sometimes you're just stuck. You're just like, should I do this or do this? And you don't want to burn a lot of energy when it's just something small like where you're gonna eat or just some stupid decision that you just I got it's it's this or this flip a coin like just have some simple random choice technique that you use to get you out of the stuck place and I know I do this a lot I mean flip a coin um so I'll sometimes I'll just do eeny meeny miny mo <laughs> because it just gets me out of it because I don't want to stay stuck in that stupid space of just not making some dumb decision that I could burn like 10 minutes thinking about it. So flip a coin, say a little prayer to yourself, and maybe that will kind of shift you out of it. Some people do muscle testing. You can look that one up. There's a thousand ways you can go about getting to just out of that stuck place. And sometimes it's just some kind of random choice technique that you have. Uh, But the simplest one is just flip a coin. You know, flip a coin and go, okay, heads, it's this, tails, it's this. Okay, and then you just move forward. If it has no major consequence, don't stay stuck. Have some stupid little technique that you need to just get you out of that situation because you don't want to burn a lot of energy, especially when it's nothing pressing. It's just a small little decision. And there's constantly, every day, there's always some little decision that you need to, to come across. But I know for myself that... I get into it. I'm like, oh, should I do this? And I, I could spin on it. And I just, I've set, a, and I've mentioned this in previous podcasts, I've set a goal to not stay stuck. I have very low tolerance for staying stuck. If you just set that as an intention for yourself, that you, you just have a very low tolerance for staying stuck and you will get yourself out of it as quickly as you possibly can, that is a very good life strategy, especially as a hunter type. Okay, so now let's move on to some tools. What are some tools that we can use to help us make better decisions to get us out of analysis paralysis? So the first tool is journaling, getting it out of your head and onto a piece of paper or onto your computer to get yourself unstuck. I can't stress how helpful journaling can be if you know how to use it. This is something we covered a lot in our past group that we just wrapped up. And as usual, people came back and just said that really, really helped. And I watched so many people in the group start using it as a tool. And they said, okay, journal through it. I got some clarity on this thing or this situation. It just works. So 
I won't go into all the specifics, but I want to forward you to a past episode. So it's episode 65, Journaling for Clarity. So it's exactly this particular theme. And with it, there's a, just as with this episode, there's a worksheet you can download for free that will give you some clear steps to take when you're going through your journaling process. So the basic premise is you're stuck, you're trying to make a decision, just getting it out of your head and onto a sheet of paper, onto your computer, gets you it gets you out of that stuck space where you're like, oh, it's just everything's just kind of floating around and, and and merging together and just creating a lot of overwhelm. When you're able to sit down with a journal and write it out, a lot of times that's just what you need to get clear about what is the best decision in this in this particular situation. So with that you can do the simple pros and cons. I mean open up your journal, here's the decision. Again, ask yourself, what is the goal? What is the objective that you're trying to meet through this decision? And in terms of that particular podcast, ask yourself, what needs are alive that are that this decision is going to meet or not meet? So where are you struggling with that? So maybe there's a decision that it's like, okay, if I make this decision, it's really meeting my need for um, support. But maybe on the other side of this decision, uh, if it's not meeting my need for choice because it's locking me into something. There's some kind of cognitive dissonance going on that's keeping you from making the decision. And so let's give an example. So let's say you're wanting to learn to draw and you just don't feel like you're making progress doing self-study. So you're like, okay, I want to take a course. There's this course that's coming up and it's great. It's like, I'm really looking forward to it. It's that person. I really want to learn from that person. And it specifically meets your needs for structure and support. Like those are the things that you really need right now because you're just not able to, with your own willpower, make it happen on your own. But then you're stuck and you're like, why am I stuck? Okay, well, um, it's four evenings a week for two months. And you're like, oh, I really want this. I really want to take this course but I also have a need for relaxation at the end of the day. And it's like, that's a big commitment. And uh, like, I just don't think I'm going to be clear at that time. So as you're journaling, you may say, okay, wait a minute, how do I get my needs met for structure and support elsewhere? And so maybe you say, okay, well, maybe I need to keep looking and find another course that's maybe one day a week that will still meet your need for structure and support by someone you respect. And so just by going through that short process, you get clear about what you're really wanting, which is structure and support and learning. And if you can meet those needs through another strategy, then that makes the decision making a lot easier. And then you can just say, no, I'm definitely saying no to this particular course, but I'm going to move forward and find something that really fits into my schedule. And maybe it's like, oh, if it's a Saturday, maybe a Saturday morning, that's perfect because then I've, I've kind of gone through the week and I'm going to be clear at that time of day versus maybe it's nine o'clock at night, your time. And it's just like, that just doesn't fit. So that's an example of how you would use journaling to get clear about the needs alive underneath the decision and then get clear about what is the best decision moving forward. So again, I would forward you to episode 65, Journaling for Clarity, and make sure you download the free PDF from that episode. The second tool is mind mapping. I'll also talk about this one constantly. We've covered it a lot in this last group, and I'm always just super stoked to see hunter types take it on, and it clicks, and they just go just go crazy with it. And they're like, this is so great. Mind mapping is such a key tool because it helps us containerize. It helps us quickly process information and decision-making that can be such a great tool because it, it gives you sort of a, a circular view of the decision instead of something like very linear, just like notes on a sheet of paper. And sometimes just the process of going through a mind map opens up doors that you would not have gotten to had you not gone through that specific process. So I'm not going to go into all the details of it other than uh, go to episode 54, containerizing your life through mind mapping and other tools. I go through um, quite a bit of just how that process works. In the future, we will probably be doing some more courses specifically on mind mapping because it's just one of those tools that I see so many hunter types adopt and it becomes a natural part of their daily life. 
And uh, I think it's just a natural fit. So in terms of using the tool for getting unstuck, you may just put in the center of the mind map, here's the decision that you need to make. Or what I try to do is think, what is the objective? I try to put the objective right in front of me. The, my, what is my goal? Well, my goal is uh, getting support, going back to the previous example, my goal is getting support for drawing that creates more structure and support. Maybe that's the center. And if I'm clear about that going into the mind map, it's going to be so much quicker. If I, but you could just say uh, decision, the, the center of the map could be just decision to take this course. And then you use all the different sub points to say, okay, pros and cons might be one of them. Another one might be time. Another one may be like timing in terms of when I need to sign up. Just whatever the, the criteria, see if you can get those big bullet points as the first points on the tree and then tree out from there. And just going through that process of just filtering through the different pros and cons and all of the, the things that are influencing the decision, often you can get to a place of like, okay, yes, this is definitely a good fit or no, but I need to move in a, a slightly different direction to still get those needs met. So mind mapping and journaling, you can follow a similar strategy towards it. And it's hard to talk about unless you've actually practiced mind mapping, because as soon as you start using it and it starts to click, then it makes it becomes really clear how you can use it in terms of decision making, because you can filter through all of the other suggestions that we've talked about today and use it through a mind map. So again, that's episode 54, containerizing your life through mind mapping and other tools. Okay, so we covered a lot of ground in terms of getting yourself out of analysis paralysis, whether it's a small decision or a big decision. And I realized as I was prepping this episode that you really need a worksheet that goes along with this. So you have a little bit of a checklist that you can go through when you're stuck. So you can get that free PDF at drummerinthegreatmountain.com forward slash episode 75. That's drummerinthegreatmountain.com forward slash episode 75. And what you can do is when you're feeling stuck, you can just pull that out, go through the steps. And what I'm hoping it will do is it'll just get you into a space where you start to memorize those and you start getting, you build a structure for yourself so that you spend less time staying stuck. And um, let's see, we have um, in September, we will have another a live online workshop. Uh, so not quite sure the dates yet. So be sure to get on our email list if you haven't already so that you can be notified uh, when our next workshop comes available if you'd like to join us. Uh, and that's it. So until next time, be well. Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to learn more about the book, The Drummer in the Great Mountain, visit drummerinthegreatmountain.com. To join us on social media, click the links at the top of the homepage. Help us spread the word. We're a small press and reviews really help. If you've been enjoying the podcast or the book, consider writing a review on iTunes, Amazon, Goodreads, or your podcast app. If you're new to the podcast and want to quickly get up to speed on the concepts we discuss, check out our free five-day mini course. Visit drummerinthegreatmountain.com forward slash mini course. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover on future episodes, we'd love to hear from you. Please send us an email at info at drummerinthegreatmountain.com.